our event in July, our breakfast briefing in July. If you've been to our briefings before, you may recall the last couple of Julys, we decided to do something different. Instead of having a presentation, we've had a conversation or a discussion or an interview uh, with an individual. Uh, two years ago, we met and interviewed James Timpson of the Timpson Group, and we found out what made James tick and how uh, the Timpson Group were dealing with the COVID. And last year, we had Julianne Haynes from the Principality Building Society, again, giving an insight into her background, some of uh, her work and how she and Principality were dealing with um, COVID at that point. Uh, next month, on a date to be determined, we are really pleased to be well, able to welcome Sarah John. Sarah is the founder of Boss Brewing, and some of you may know some of her history. It's a really interesting story how somebody a female decided to take on the establishment to a certain extent and set up a brewery. It's not typical. I spent 10 years working in a brewery and it was a very male driven environment. Um, and she, her story is a very interesting one about how she decided that she would shake up the status quo, how she as a mother would take her child to their, um, their board meetings. It was totally against the grain to a certain extent. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the story that um, of, of her discussions with Hugo Boss. Hugo Boss took uh, umbrage the fact that Boss Brewing were using the Boss name and they, they ended up in court discussing that. So there's going to be a huge amount to discuss. It's a really, it will be a really um, interesting um, conversation and discussion with Sarah. She's a really interesting entrepreneur and should be um, well worth hearing. If you have any suggestions, any thoughts of uh, events that we can run in the autumn, please do get in touch, whether you have any ideas of somebody who could present or whether you have an idea of a topic that you'd like us to um, investigate and, and try and find somebody to speak, um, then we're more than happy to do so. Just, uh, just give me a call. Don't forget, we're still running our Lean Six Sigma programs, uh, the Yellow Belt program uh, at the end of June and then another one in, in July. Again, these programs are designed for uh, individuals at perhaps the grassroots level of your business teaching them about some of the core principles of lean, lean processes and how they can contribute to um, improving your business processes. So it's a really good program. This one's still being done online. We're still running the two day course online. Um, so do get in touch. Hannah is here. Um, get in touch with Hannah, give her a call um, and we can, uh, we can give you further information on that too. And don't forget uh, that we have a wealth of knowledge and experience based here in the business school. Uh, if you have any thoughts, if you think you're in a position at the moment to put together or to try and design a bespoke course, then please do approach us. Um, as I say, we can put together, we're more than happy to look at your requirements and discuss with you how we can put together a bespoke program that would cover all of your requirements and your needs. And finally, don't forget if you're um, a, an SME, and you've heard about the Help to Grow program, then um, please do get in touch. We're running this. The next program will be held in the autumn. And uh, it's a 12 week program. If you don't know about it for specifically for SMEs, primarily sub subsidized by the government. Um, and it's a, an intensive course, both with our academics, but also an opportunity to, for you to work with your peer groups. There are as many as 25 of you on the uh, on the program at the same time great opportunity to work with colleagues but also um, you become uh, a, a, a aligned with a mentor as well who can help you progress your business and um, and and help you through the challenges of uh, post pandemic uh, this post pandemic world so do get in touch with Linda Hellard um, and if uh, just have a conversation with her if that's uh, of interest to you so uh, I'm going to hand over to Mike now just a reminder that this morning's event is being recorded, as we heard the reminder just now. Uh, and if you do have any questions, if you're online, and you have any questions, please drop your question into the chat box. One of the team may come back to you and let you know and ask whether or not you're happy for us to unmute you and for you, for you to ask your own question or whether you'd like one of the team to ask a question on your behalf. Uh, and if you're in the room here, if you just put your hand up, we'll bring a microphone over to you. Um, and if you can just introduce yourselves before you ask the question, it helps the, um, the, the, the guys at home. Uh, know who, who's posing the question. Other than that, I'm going to hand over to you, Mike, uh, and thank you again. Thank you, um, and um, welcome everybody. Uh, great to be here. I am sort of, yeah, yeah last, just checking, I, I'm, 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 I'm the best at messing up the technology, so we have to check. Um, 
But whilst I am sort of a, not quite a last minute stand in, a late stand in, it is the day job. So if I mess it up, there's no excuses. Um, this morning, we'll be talking about the Development Bank of Wales. I'll make an introduction briefly, about five, 10 minutes on the Development Bank of Wales. Then my colleague, Sean Price, will be talking about a specific initiative uh, set up when we created the Development Bank of Wales about five years ago called Economic Intelligence Wales. And then I'll come back on to talk about equity market in Wales, uh, the equity investing that we do at the Development Bank of Wales, the challenges and why it's important going forward. And I definitely have to come to the blockchain uh, presentation because we've made a blockchain investment recently. I sat on equity, uh, sat on the investment committee. I just did not have a first clue what was going on with it. So I definitely need to get on that. <clears throat> Course, right. So briefly uh, who we are. So the Development Bank of Wales is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Welsh government created five years ago based on its predecessor organization, which was something called Finance Wales, which was set up back in 2000, 2001 as the distributor of uh, European funding. Um, that's the way it was done then. It came, uh, the cash came direct from Europe to uh, the Welsh European Funding Office. And then Finance Wales was one of the deliverers of that cash, uh, more specifically the direct investment equity and debt. So about five years ago, make, the decision was taken to um, build on Finance Wales credentials, if you like, and with a much bigger, broader, uh, ambitious organization hence the Development Bank was born. So there's our mission for you. Um, it, it, it focused on Wales um, and focused exclusively really on uh, sustainable finance into the Welsh economy. Uh, I did say that the Development Bank of Wales is, is a broader, uh, larger business than Finance Wales. And there are a number of initiatives uh, and new strings to our bows, which I'll touch on in a moment. One of them is economic intelligence, which Sean will talk about in some detail a bit later. Um, but um, you were more than just investing direct into businesses now. So the vision is a unique resource for Wales, um, all about long-term value, all about investing the cash and getting it back so that we can reinvest that cash in future generations of Wales, Welsh businesses. And our value is obviously, as you expect, as a public sector at its heart organisation, we'd have to be open, we're responsible to a very wide range of stakeholders, not just our own, uh, um, the uh, Welsh Government, but also the thousands of businesses that we, uh, we have as portfolio businesses, and then investors in our funds. And we've got some private sector investors, such as a pension funds, but also the British Business Bank um, and uh, local authorities. So <clears throat> partnership is at the key, is at the heart of, of what we do. All of our deals, we try to bring in the private sector along with us. We're not here to displace the private sector, we're there to bring them along, and, maybe, and mostly we would do the risky parts of the investment, encouraging the private sector, uh, mostly banks, uh, majority of our investments will be co-invested with banks, but increasingly uh, challenger banks and uh, alternative funders that we, the, we link with, but we try to bring them in. In fact, we've got specific targets to do so. I mean, it's a good opportunity for us to look at today briefly at the Development Bank, because it, we are um, this is our fifth year anniversary, and we're currently in the process of designing the plan now for the next five years. So the first five years focused on um, uh, goals, uh, which were sort of of the time uh, and in keeping with the European type funding that we received. And that would be how much we invested, how much private sector leverage we could bring in alongside us, jobs created and jobs safeguarded, and then um, all of that combined together uh, to measure the economic impact that we had. Um, pleased to say we did very well on those five targets, but time's moved on. As I mentioned to you, we're doing the five-year plan now for the next five years, and we'll have a much broader suite of impact metrics. Um, haven't finalized them yet, but jobs will move on from just jobs created to safeguards of the quality of the jobs that we're creating. <clears throat> Private sector leverage will include some focus on more equity um, because that's important, and we'll talk about that later on. Uh, but uh, new homes is another area where we've become active since we became the Development Bank of Wales. So a much broader suite of metrics to measure our um, impact. So having said that, at the core of what we do is invest in cash, invest in money, it used to be predominantly European money. Now it's predominantly Welsh government investment into our business. And um, I'll show you a slide in a moment that shows the growth in our investing, but the the growth of our investment is not just more of the same. The key thing is that we've diversified. Um, when I first joined Finance Wales, 
all those years ago. And for the first 10, 12 years of the organization, we really had one fund at a time. And those funds would do debt uh, and equity. Um, capped out at £100,000 debt for the first 10 years, equity, million, maybe £2 million. Very different today. You know, the firepower, if I can call it that, that has been invested in us by the Welsh Government to, to invest in Welsh businesses significantly larger. So quick, broken down into segments there. Micro loans or small business loans, one to £50,000, is the majority of what we do by number of deals. 60% of the deals we do, 250, 300 a year would be to micro loans, but it would only be about 6% of the volume that we do because of the size, the number of the deals, the size of the deals average about 25, 30,000 pounds. Very quick turnaround, debt focused on small uh, SMEs. Um, large business loans obviously does what it says on the tin, up to 10 million pounds, significantly larger than we used to be because of the size of our balance sheet. Uh, and that would be, um, uh, the majority of the investment that we would make, but obviously not majority in terms of numbers of deals because they're much larger. Actually, the average is about half a million pounds for, for, for a later stage debt deal. And then equity uh, and tech venture investment, we do up to 10 million pounds. We haven't done that in one round. That would be following uh, follow on investments to portfolio businesses that we continue to back. Uh, we don't actually have any at 10 million at the moment, but there are some view of the portfolio, about five million pounds. And most of our equity investing is in early stage tech ventures um, investments. There is growth capital in our succession, equity deals we do as well, and I'll talk about those later on, but most is in our tech um, early stage, IP rich, uh, high growth businesses, which are important for the economy of Wales. And then a, recent, a relatively recent phenomenon, about seven years ago, ju actually just before we became the development bank, we started to do property development loans direct to property developers for, for, for new homes uh, because the banks had pulled out of that market uh, back 2010, actually 2010, 2011. Um, and we saw a gap in the market. The Welsh Government backed us with a, an initial fund of 10. They didn't miss anything. Um, uh, so <laughs> now the property development loans is about 40% of our annual run rate. So it's 40 to 50 million pounds. Now we invest in small property developers. It's not the big boys, it's not Persimmon, Bellway, people like that. These are small businesses uh, building typically up to 25, 30 units. So, and that is right across Wales. That is our most geographically diverse fund in terms of the investment that we make into businesses because of the economic power of South uh, Wales, you know, in Cardiff, most of our investments do get skewed because of the number of businesses. That one, that fund is very uh, geographically diverse. Um, and actually North Wales is particularly development. Even more recently than when we first set up the property development, we've, we've diversified into commercial property uh, development. And now we've got a commercial property fund uh, that has been running for two to three years and is going very well. So there, I said, I mentioned earlier, our performance, this is pure investment, none of the additional services um, that I mentioned earlier. And you can see right back at the start, 2001, where they formed Finance Wales, um, li literally there for the first 10, 11 years, we had one fund um, and there was about 40 or 50 people working in the organization. You know, you can see from 2017, when we became the development bank, got the increased firepower and much broader service offering, you know, the growth has been, um, uh, impressive from our perspective. The big spike there in 2019, 2020 comes back to uh, COVID, where we set up a COVID um, relief fund, if you like, to support businesses. If you cast your uh, mind back to when we first went into the COVID pandemic and everyone was panicking, businesses were looking to sandbag their balance sheets just to get the cash because we didn't know how long it was going to go on for. We managed to, to invest £92 million, pounds, I think it was, in about three months which would, would have been the equivalent of what we'd invested the year before. So there was a massive demand for cash. And it really that underlines the importance of the Development Bank, I guess, as a tool to support the Welsh economy. We were able to divert funds from other funds very quickly to support a very specific need for the uh, economy. Um, this year, it's a little bit out of date, this year about £110 million, which is our year end in March. So another, uh, another strong year, more growth. Um, but nothing like, of course, 19 and 20, um, which is something I'm sure we all don't wish to repeat. 
So I'll hand you over to Sean now uh, to talk about one of the new services that we that I mentioned earlier, uh, economic intelligence. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Sean Price. I'm Research and Partnership Manager at the Development Bank, and I'm the Project Manager for Economic Intelligence Wales. Um, as Mike mentioned, uh, Economic Intelligence Wales launched um, in June 2018, about, so it's been operating now for about four years coming up. Um, and it's a research collaboration between the Development Bank itself, Cardiff Business School and the ONS. And it has a particular focus on the Welsh economy, Welsh SMEs and uh, a real big focus on the supply, demand and cost of finance in Wales. So I'm going to talk you briefly through some of the outputs which EIW produces and talk you through some of the highlights from our most recent research. So since its launch in June 2018, um, EIW has been publishing quarterly and annual reports. These reports are written by the Welsh Economy Research Unit here at Cardiff Business School, led by Professor Max Mundy. The reports are then um, reviewed by the EIW steering group, which uh, is made up of representatives from the three parties, as well as a number of representatives from Welsh Government. These quarterly reports uh, track macroeconomic and Welsh SME finance market data, as well as data on the Development Bank's own investment activity and impact. The frequency of these reports has enabled EIW to track the impact of the pandemic as it evolved and as well as the impact of UK and Welsh government support schemes. And they've helped embed EIW's reputation amongst policy influencers and government officials as they provide regular recurring Wales level data and analysis. So our latest quarterly report was published a week ago. Each of our reports covers the global UK and regional economic prospects, the SME picture in Wales and UK, the provision of SME finance and the cost of finance, as well as the Development Bank's activity. And this most recent report um, was a significant um, change from the previous quarterly report, hence uh, due to the speed at which the economic uh, data is changing. So uh, the optimism that was exp being experienced at the end of 2021 has dwindled with a worsening outlook for the global economy in the early months of this year, obviously exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. And forecasts for UK and global economies have been downgraded and there's a high level of uncertainty. So the report for June showed a very mixed picture um, with GDP recovering to above pre-pandemic levels. Too far. Um, there's also evidence of further tightening of the labour market conditions in the UK with high levels of vacancies and employment rates falling. Wales had one of the lowest unemployment rates in the UK to the, in the three months to February 2022 at just 3% compared to 3.8% in the UK. And obviously inflation at a 30 year high and set to hit 10% by the end of the autumn as the UK war drives up fuel and energy prices. But even since this report was published just a week ago, there have been two further major data announcements. One, a forecast for the UK economy by the OECD, um, showing that the UK economy will grow more slowly than expected this year and will stagnate next year, um, with the UK economy set to grow 3.6% this year and 0% growth next year meaning that the UK economy will go from the second fastest growing economy in the G7 group to the slowest growing in 2023. And secondly, and this was uh, just yesterday, so GDP numbers for April showing um, that there are a number of fears now over prospects for the UK economy after it shrank in April, with businesses feeling the impact of rising prices. Um, so 0.3% contraction in April, uh, following a 0.1% contraction in March. So the April figure was weaker than was expected. And it's the first time the economy has contracted for two months in a row since the onset of COVID. So some analysts are, are starting to warn um, that the UK is at risk of falling into a recession. 
Um, moving on to the SME picture in the UK and Wales, first of all, exports. Um, the value of Welsh exports increased um, to 15.2 billion over the year to December 21 with the value of goods imports increasing um, to 16.1 billion over the same period. However, despite this growth, there are concerns that a number of small SME exporters are ceasing to trade with the UK, with the EU, due to rising fixed costs. And there's evidence of falling number of UK EU trading relationships between buyers and sellers. SMEs in Wales are concerned about rising costs with 37% of them revealing they've been significantly impacted by increased costs in the year to um, quarter four 2021. And in terms of the number of SMEs in Wales, the numbers declined during 2021 with the largest decrease being in the number of enterprises in the micro size band. Um, in addition to this, the small business confidence index that the FSB publishes contracted markedly in the quarter to quarter four 2021, moving into negative values. And Welsh SME confidence was lower than in any other region in the UK in that quarter. In terms of SME finance, bank lending has returned to levels seen prior to the pandemic, uh, with 20.46 billion of bank lending into SMEs in Wales um, in the year to quarter two. Um, it's estimated that 0.6 million small firms across the UK borrowed for the first time during the pandemic, according to the British Business Bank. The SME Finance Monitor revealed that 43% of UK SMEs had used externally generated finance uh, last year compared to 37% in the previous year. And the growth was largely evidenced in smaller SMEs. There's been a lot, uh, lot of change in the equity market and Mike will come on to talk uh, in more detail about that in a minute. Um, but in the period quarter one to quarter three of last year, um, private equity investments in SMEs in the UK reached 14 billion, um, which is compared to a total for the whole of 2020 of 8.7 billion. So that, that um, part of the uh, finance market is certainly uh, on the up. But um, the growth has been very geographically uneven. And there were just 32 deals uh, in Wales in that same period although there was an increase in the value of deals, um, which was 63 million in that, um, that period, at 14% on the previous year. Okay, moving on to our bespoke reports. These are um, reports that we do on topics of particular interest and relevance to the Welsh economy. These are more in-depth reports. Um, and a number of them include primary research. Again, these are produced by the team at uh, the Welsh Economy Research Unit. So with the onset of the pandemic, um, it was agreed that the steering group, by the steering group and Welsh Government, that EIW should produce a series of reports on the impacts of COVID-19 um, interventions by Welsh Government. So, so far we've published two reports on this topic with the next report due before the end of the year. So they've, been, uh, they've included an analysis of administrative data from the main economic resilience fund, the ERF interventions, which have been funded by Welsh government. And the last report back in April also included a large scale survey of, of beneficiaries. Ultimately, the aim with these reports is to assess the impact of the Wales specific interventions over a period of two or three years, and there'll obviously be a longitudinal element to the survey work. So for uh, the April report, um, this included um, analysis of over 1700 survey respondents um, with the survey fieldwork taking place between August and October of last year. And it was really um, encouraging to see that 95% of the businesses supported in the early rounds of the ERF funding were still trading at the time of the survey um, last autumn. 86% of respondents felt that the support from Welsh Government was as important as the COVID job retention scheme in safeguarding employment. Uh, in terms of employment itself, 22% of respondents said that employee numbers had grown since the beginning of the pandemic, 
and 23% had fewer employees at the, at the time of the survey than prior to the pandemic. So before, before we started on that series um, of bespoke reports, we published a report on equity clusters in Wales, um, examining in detail SME access to equity in Wales and the extent to which Cardiff was developing as an equity cluster. And an equity cluster is defined as a region where equity deals tend to be grouped together um, into geographic clusters where innovative companies, skilled labour and equity investors locate close together. Regions with relatively high numbers of equity investment show more robust economic growth, increasing employment rates and high economic prosperity. However, SME equity supply and demand ex uh, gaps exist in many peripheral UK regions, including Wales, and they're associated with geographically specific social, economic and political contexts. I'll hand you back to Mike now, we'll explore the market in a bit more detail. Thanks, Shannon. So, um, just, just, just to set the scene at the start, um, Use a snapshot of so um, equity investment across the UK, and no surprises, right? London uh, dominates 45% of, of the deals are done there by volume, um, followed by north, southeast, and then the northwest, which is all the way around there. Um, uh, Wales is 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 um, is at the lower end, obviously, with the, the the regions that we tend to find ourselves with quite often, which is Northern Ireland. You can see 1.5% there, Northern Ireland, Wales, 1.3%, uh, and the Northeast there, 1.2%. Similar demographics, sim similar geographies, similar um, populations. <clears throat> so that's the size of the challenge. I don't suppose we'll ever get to compete with uh, London, um, but certainly, you know, the, 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 the mission for Finance Wales and now the Development Bank of Wales to grow the equity funding um, is, is, is a big challenge, right? Um, made a bit easier, I think, um, or less difficult, I should say, um, with the, the, the move now to um, uh, uh, geography being less important. So, you know, with um, the pandemic, you know, it's come the use of uh, the things of Teams and online. Um, I, I think somebody described it as um, geography now being history in terms of deals. And many of these London um, equity investors are doing deals in London and outside the regions. <clears throat> so, but nonetheless, you know, we're coming from a very small, low, low base and um, we've got plenty of work to do. So when I showed the slide earlier around the formation of the investment run rate for Finance Wales and then up to um, the Development Bank of Wales, and we've seen the acceleration in the last five years. When we first created Finance Wales, one of the reasons for that creation in 2000 and 2001 is, is that 3i closed its last office uh, in Wales, and they were the last institutional investor before Finance Wales to have uh, a presence in Wales. That was one of the region, that was one of the reasons Finance Wales was created. Um, although Finance Wales did not do an equity deal for two years. So that shows the culture, um, I think, of what, of what, um, what we were stepping into. Um, and we'll explore some of the reasons in a moment for aversion to equity, but you know, it has been a, a slow burn, I think it's fair to say, you know, for that first 10, 12 years, there was very little um, impact made in terms of the quality, uh, the number of equity investments being made in Wales. <clears throat> I'm pleased to say that's accelerated um, quite significantly. Um, going back from 2011 there, you've got 48 deals with them. There's 148 in 2020, slightly higher in 2021. These figures are a little bit out of date. Um, but you can see that, um, 2020 was um, the biggest year on record by volume, if not by numbers of deals. And I think there's quite a few um, factors in that. Be the firepower that we have, because in, what, in Development Bank of Wales, we're responsible for most of those deals. You know, the firepower and the breadth of the funding that we talked about earlier, and I'll just touch on it again in a moment, you know, before we could only do later stage, um, later stage uh, growth equity deals couldn't do early stage, couldn't do tech where most of the um, deals are done and we couldn't do succession deals either. So a very narrow product range from our perspective. That expansion, um, low interest rate 
I think um, economy, you know, the interest rate has been very low for a number of years. So people looking for other investments because interest at, uh, at the banks is next to zero. But also there's ge generally been um, more awareness, more acceptability, things like Dragon's Den, not everyone's cup, cup of tea, but you know, it, it's, it's a raising the awareness and equity uh, funding is, um, is definitely uh, on the up. So one of the other challenges when we were pretty much the only guys in town going back 10, 12 years as Finance Wales was um, the equity culture uh, uh, was low because there weren't many other providers. There wasn't a great awareness amongst the much of the corporate finance advisory group and pretty easy to get there actually, even for equity risk type investments. So, you know, against that backdrop, you know, you can understand why owners would be averse to um, take it on equity because it is a bit more complicated, it is a bit more involved, and it does necessitate that emotional um, uh, challenge of someone else owning a bit of your business, uh, which, which, which is difficult for entrepreneurs. Um, and part of our mission is to explain to them why that is a good thing. Um, one of the big positives for us has been the number of co-investors that we brought in. Um, when we had the Wales Business Fund, I forget when that uh, commenced, um, about seven, seven years ago, uh, there was a quirk with the equity that we had to have private sector leverage. We had to have a third party equity funder to prove the price for state aid reasons, which we thought actually is a challenge for us um, because we could not do a deal unless we had at least 30% co-investment by uh, a third party equity investor, which was a challenge. But actually, conversely, it's been really good for the Welsh economy uh, and good for us as an investor, having these third parties we've had to bring in to do these deals. And the number of them are on there. You wouldn't have found the likes of Maven or Mercia doing deals in Wales before we encouraged them in. They're a fund manager of similar size to uh, the development bank. There's been a growth um, even in the larger equity investors, such as the Business Growth Fund, of course, that was set up by the UK government, and that's, they would sit slightly above us, I would say. Typical deal for them would start at about five million pounds. Um, didn't do very many deals at all when they were formed about 10 years ago. They did no deals for, for a number of years. Then it was one or two in Wales. That has definitely accelerated recently. We've seen them on quite a few deals, and we've co-invested with them on at least three. So more activity there, for sure, business growth. Um, Lloyd's Development Capital LDC at the top there. We haven't co-invested with them, but those guys are above the BGF. They uh, very rarely would look at anything less than a 10 million pound investment. And those, there are those deals in Wales. Actually, it's quite a prominent one that they've invested in, which is ZipWorld. You all must have seen that company. They made that investment. But there, there aren't that many opportunities in Wales um, for equity investments of that size. But nonetheless, the individual runs the Southwestern Wales team is based in Cardiff and is well known to the community. So I'd expect to see more. The other, um, a number of the other co-investors, such as the Wealth Club, uh, Crowdcube, Cedars, are uh, um, a crowd investors. Um, and this comes back to the point I made earlier around individuals looking for better value for their savings, you know, using EIS, using the SEIS schemes, investing businesses directly. So that has been a real growth over the last um, five years or so. And Angels Invest Wales, there is, is an, another important co-investor for us, which is the Welsh um, uh, Business Angels Investment Vehicle, which is a subsidiary of the Development Bank, actually. So they sit in the same business as us, uh, building rather, which is useful for co-investing. And that, that business was used to be known as something called Xenos, a um, bit of an obscure um, name. People didn't really know what it did. But when we rebranded as the Development Bank, we rebranded it uh, as Enos to Angels Invest Wales. And that was another uh, challenge by the Welsh Government to do more in that space, uh, make more investments, make it bigger, make it better. And it is significantly larger now. We're regularly investing over a couple of million pounds per year. There's over 250 angels looking to invest in Welsh businesses. Uh, and there is a, a co-investment fund, which... Which is, which is a great model, actually. So once we approve a lead angel investor, and they have to be an experienced investor, uh, <coughs> we, we, being Angels Invest, will match fund any investment they make into a business with no due diligence on our part. We rely 100% on the expertise and the decision of the lead angel investor. 
they put two hundred thousand pounds in, we would match it two hundred thousand pounds on exactly the same terms. So very uh, hands off from our perspective, but it is, it is to encourage more investment into these high growth businesses. So, you know, this this ten years ago, eleven years ago, this would have been a, almost an empty screen in terms of third party funders, and there are a number of others that we've made investments alongside, uh, and all of that will help with the culture, getting advisors, getting Welsh businesses um, used to the option of equity. When you know, when I I joined from a bank, so equity is not my background. But you know, there was this there was this thought that actually it was Welsh businesses were averse to um, equity. That's absolutely not the case. You know, one of our other subsidiaries is something called FW Capital, which is fund management contracts to be run outside of Wales. A dedicated bespoke team in the northeast and the northwest, and SMEs are exactly the same there. They take some convincing to take equity. It, it is a, it is, um, you know, it's something you need to convince them of the benefits of. It is not a Welsh thing, absolutely. So, there's um, a graph showing last few years uh, since the launch of the development bank in terms of the growth in equity, and you can see um, much broader. As I said earlier, when we were delivering European funds, we only had growth capital to do, and that is the toughest of all to sell to businesses because. Growth capital equity, you are looking to invest equity into businesses that are profitable with turnover, established, you know, quite often with, um, with, um, with a, a founder, a director who's, who's, who's rate, who started and grown that business all on his own. So they have other options. They can go, they can go for debt. You know, banks uh, will lend to these businesses because they're profitable. They've got EBITDA to service the debt. Tech seed and venture, these are pre-revenue, IP rich, startup businesses, um, that do not have the option of bank debt or any debt, actually. So, you know, that is an easier sell, I guess, to get those guys to take equity. They're also younger. They tend, do tend to be younger founders, more open to it. Um, and that has fueled the growth in our equity investment. When we set up that team about 10 years ago, uh, the tech ventures team, which, which is very different to the other teams, actually. That's a, that's a useful point of note. Um, our equity, um, our property teams, and our micro teams are, are all populated by accountants, ex-bankers, um, so people used to um, funding uh, debt. The venture team and our taxi team, the bankers or accountants in there, uh, majority are PhDs, uh, people who've worked in universities, so they understand finance, but they understand um, opportunities and high growth businesses better than the structure of the funding. Succession is uh, a, a, a MBOs and MBIs. We couldn't do those through European funds, although we did manage to get some money from the Welsh government to do the odd succession deal, but we certainly didn't have a heritage in that before we became the development bank. We managed to raise actually um, private funds from a Welsh pension fund to invest in a succession fund. And you can see there was, there was no investment there 2017, 18, because we didn't have this dedicated fund. Um, but last year, we had our best year ever, uh, and those are leveraged buyouts. Those are very low risk equity deals. These are established, profitable businesses. Important for Wales because we're funding them for the management teams to buy into them and retain those businesses in Wales. There's an awful lot of money from overseas um, looking to acquire uh, businesses in the UK and Wales and take them, relocate them. So we are uh, investing in the next level, uh, the next year of management. To retain those businesses in Wales, um, but also gives a shot in the arm to the businesses. Uh, a number of these businesses grow then with new management to take them on to the next level. So uh, the bad news for me and Rian, if she was here today, is that target is, is going up and up. Um, the, uh, are, are quite right, because it, as we'll talk about in a minute, it is important for the future of the Welsh economy. Um, one, one specific challenge, which we'll come on to now, is the geographical spread. And we talk about Sean mentioned clusters just a moment ago. You know, we've got the weight of businesses. There's the most populous um, parts of Wales in terms of businesses and high growth businesses. And then there's no surprises then when, you know, uh, this map shows red is where we do most of our equity investing. No surprises, you know, that is the most populous bit of North Wales, um, the same as South Wales. And then there's Swansea, where we get quite a few spin outs from Swansea University. Um, Probably compounding that is these are where our offices are. Our offices are our staff are based in Wrexham, based in Swansea, actually, just outside Swansea, um, and Cardiff. 
So, you know, we've got our people there. That's where the businesses are, uh, chicken and the egg. Um, but interestingly, our, I said earlier, one of the challenges for our uh, last European fund, the Wales Business Fund, was that we had to get third party equity investment, which was a real challenge. Another real challenge with that, the weight of that money, particularly the equity, has to be invested in somewhere called West Wales and the Valleys, which is not quite just West Wales. It is, is everywhere, really, rather than Cardiff um, and a bit, and actually Powys um, and a bit of North Wales. So, you know, the weight of our cash has to be invested or had to be invested where there were least businesses. So that's been a real uh, challenge for us. Um, hence why we have to have those regional offices. <clears throat> so briefly our sort of portfolio if you like um very busy um slides i can i can sympathize um exposure by sector is on the left hand side and you can see um that's the value that's the value that's the amount of investment we've made into these sectors um and then on the other side is the number of companies probably a couple of points to draw out here are you know the, uh, the, 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 when we formed the Tech Ventures team um, 10 years ago, it was heavily um, populated by people with a life sciences, medical devices background. So na naturally, they did more of those type of deals. Yeah. And also because they're our most mature investments, so they were the first investments that we were making, that would explain why you know, the majority of the volume of, of our exposure are in those sectors, because we invested we would typically invest three four rounds um, in an equity uh, portfolio business so they will be most mature also uh, most of our value is is in there if i showed you a different slide um, you can see we've worked hard um, broadened the team's expertise and uh, we're making more investments into there's a long tail there isn't there of other sectors that we've invested in but definitely you know fintech um, uh, cyber tech, ed tech, we're seeing much more of these opportunities now. <clears throat> so in our experience then, so part of the sales job, if you like, for us to get businesses to take equity, less of a sales job, as I said, with, with your tech ventures and your early stage businesses, because they can't, they can't take debt, you know, and they, and they want to grow quickly. They want to grab that competitive advantage before somebody else comes along with something um, that um, trumps their USP, if you like. So the quickest way to, to do that is by equity investment. You don't have the burden of servicing the debt. And typically an equity backed business will grow three times quicker than a debt backed business is the, is the rule of thumb. Um, but it is up to us to convince management teams. Firstly, why take equity? Because as I said, later stage businesses also have the choice of, of debt. Um, why take equity? And then the, the flip side of that slide I showed you earlier with all the other equity providers, why take us? Um, because They've all got cash, and there's a lot of equity cash now chasing good deals, which is great for the Welsh economy. So, I mean, these are the four key areas for me. Patient capital, you know, we've got no burden of, of, of the cash going out the door to repay um, bank loans or loans. So that cash can all be reinvested back into the growth of the business. And patient capital, you know, is a bit of a uh, buzzword the last few years. Um, uh, you know, equity was always patient capital for me. Um, typical holding for us from first investment would be seven to 10 years before we exit. <clears throat> Obviously, there are some significantly longer than that, uh, and not enough significantly shorter than that. Um, alignment of investors, this is important for us, you know, part of our when we get to know a business to convince them to take equity, it is, um, we have to be aligned, we're a minority investor, we can't control the board, we, you know, we're not majority, um, as LDC would be, where you know we can make all the decisions on strategic direction of the business. We have to be aligned from day one. Um, and when we've got that wrong, so if we're investing in a business, a couple of examples where the business didn't really want equity, they just couldn't take any more debt, but so they had to take equity, that is a recipe for a very tough relationship, particularly if you are holding 20 25 percent would be a typical equity hold for us so you know if they don't really if they're not bought into the benefits of equity and they don't take this to have to you know those relationships can be very difficult and they you know they never they never go well so we take a lot of time to make sure we're all aligned we all know where we're going we all know when we expect to exit the business and how 
what that looks like. It doesn't always pan out, but it does help if you're all on the same page from day one. So value creation plans is, is, is um, something that we didn't do very well in the early days and something that we learned from some of the bigger boys, if you like equity, the likes of LDC, would, um, that's the first thing they do is sit down with the business, let's understand the strengths and weaknesses, which bits need to be improved, what is the strategy for growth, and then we deliver that plan. Now, that could be geographical e expansion, new products. Um, the, the point of the matter is to get the management team to buy in um, and explain, you know, where the growth for the business is possible, and then it's up to us to help facilitate that. We don't sit on, um, <clears throat> on all the boards that we invest in, and we don't appoint non-exec directors. Um, some equity houses will insist every single time they will put one, and sometimes in the case of the BGF, I should appoint two people to the boards. You know, we only appoint non-execs if, if they're going to add value, if, if the management needs that additional bandwidth or that additional skill set. About a third to 40% I think we appoint a non-exec. Um, we, if we don't appoint a non-exec, we will uh, quite often appoint an observer, though, um, and that will be um, an internal member staff to turn up to board meetings and report back on progress. <clears throat> but that is something that we work hard to improve because the quality of, as we call it, our black book, which is the consultants, co-investors, expertise in non-execs wasn't good enough years ago. And quite, you know, and, and quite rightly some businesses, you know, want more than, well, lots of people who take equity want more than just cash, right? Because they can pretty much get the cash anywhere. Um, so those are the four key areas. I think we're gonna listen to Steve now talk, I think about everything but, but the cash in terms of an equity investment from us. I'm Steve Lanigan, CEO of ALS People. ALS People are recruitment specialists supplying temporary labour to the warehousing, waste management and recycling facilities across the UK. I joined ALS in 2014, having worked at a national recycling company for seven years. I was approached by one of the original founders with a vision towards growing a large-scale recruitment business and a plan for a three to four year journey towards a management buyout. Very early Development Bank of Wales bought into what we wanted to do, how we wanted to deliver it and felt we had a credible plan. They wrapped around non-executive extra support and support from their wider network to then help us to execute that plan. Development Bank of Wales provide a patient capital service because they have an equity investment they have a vested interest in making sure the business succeeds and it's different to typical mainstream debt so by having a partner that's got skin in the game they also then look at how they can support the business how they can support you as an individual and ultimately they have a vested interest in making sure you realize and execute your own plan the network you get wrapped around you from development bank of wales plus some of their other stakeholders in terms of sound legal, financial advice, accounting, but also non-exec directors, other people who've gone through the same journey. That entire wraparound is really intrinsic to help and make sure that we're successful. And it's helped us to shape the business, but also to learn from other people. 2018 was our first year of being eligible to enter the Fast Growth 50 Awards, and we were very fortunate to win the overall awards for that year. We went from 2018 about a 13, 14 million pound run rate and we've grown all the way to a run rate of about 55 million pound today. That has been delivered through Management Succession Fund, the support from Development Bank of Wales, but also the time, the patience and the desire to help us build a management team that are now taking our business forward even further. It's inevitable. I'm Steve Lanigan, CEO of ALS People. Great. Perfect. Um, only thing to note on there was, you know, Steve talked about everything but the cash that he got. You know, it was the support and all the other stuff that he valued. And they don't always become uh, fastest growing business or, or have that growth. But uh, you know, that's what you can do if, if you are aligned. Uh, briefly now, because I've overrun, I think, is, um, you know, the challenges are, I've talked about it already, education and awareness of equity. It's been a, it's been a slow burn, but it feels like momentum over the last few years is, um, is changing things. And you have seen from a couple of the graphs. Co-investors, we talked at length about crowding in, you know, that is here to stay. You know, these businesses are here doing deals now, not necessarily just with us, they're making investments. 
but also British Business Bank, we understand are bringing an equity fund in a couple of years to Wales and Cardiff Capital Region are tendering now for equity funds specific to the region. So, you know, there's definitely momentum in, in, in this sector. <clears throat> the cultural version of SMEs still remains. If they can get cheap bank debt, they quite often will, but it feels like that, that is changing. Um, we need to do more geographically, but also with underrepresented groups. That's a challenge to us, quite rightly, for the Welsh government, because um, you know that you know that is something that we we just need to work harder at, and and hopefully uh, develop the the first Welsh tech unicorn. We've got a couple of very exciting businesses in the portfolio. Um, nothing quite approaching unicorn status uh, just yet. That's not. We've overridden me now, which is good. We should have done that a long time ago. Yeah. There we go. Um, why did why I talked about earlier? Why is equity important? Um, well, you know these stats show um, that those businesses that receive equity are likely to see their productivity increase bigger than a general sample. Um, they innovate more um, and they're more digitally active, but also the quality of the jobs that they create and the speed at which they grow are all better than if taking uh, debt. Um, so there's the conclusion. I won't read you out the whole slide there, you know, um, you know from, 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 from something that's taken 20 years to get to this stage, I think Finance Wales and Development Bank, the last five years, and particularly now, there feels like this groundswell, definitely momentum in equity, much more uh, um, acceptance of it from corporate advisors and businesses, much more providers of equity. And that is the difference between somewhere like the Northwestern here, okay, they've got a bigger stock of businesses. We, we run a small debt fund in the Northwest, but the difference is they've had an equity culture and equity um, houses, if you like, north of 10, when Wales just had us for many years. You know, there's definitely a different culture and they're much more open. And that is where we are getting to now, you know, and there's a great, there's a great um, support network out there from, from the Welsh Government's Business Wales um, to um, universities. And we touched already on the Help to Grow uh, Management Initiative here at Cardiff University. Um, the knowledge is getting there. Um, and it's, it's, you know, our mission remains to grow, continue to grow the amount of equity that is invested in Wales. You know, those, those targets are not going anywhere anytime soon. So completely overran, sorry about that. Happy to take questions if we've got time. We, we're tight for time. I, I think uh, maybe if there is anybody who has a qu very quick question, anybody in the audience, Lloyd, yeah. Uh, Lloyd Powell from ACCA, Accountancy uh, Professional Body. Uh, I was going to ask about uh, equity uh, aversion, but you covered that very nicely. You talked in the introduction about sustainability. Um, is there any specific funds for supporting um, net zero journey or is there any planned as well and yeah. on the broader sustainability point to with the number of insolvencies on the rise as well to what extent is there support available for distressed businesses i realize that's not a short question at all is it <laughs> and, and, and an eclectic mix of questions as well um so um uh, we're an impact investor so uh, to the Welsh government and, to, and our stakeholders, even the private sector stakeholders, actually like pension funds, the impact that we make is just as important as the returns we make. They compromise on the returns for, for, um, so that we can maximize the impact. Uh, and we've always been uh, measured on jobs and stuff like that, but increasingly, and we're fundraising at the moment, that one of the first things that comes up from any stakeholder, uh, one of the first questions is, what are your ESG credentials? And specifically, what is your current track record and your plans for the decarb initiative. <clears throat> now, as I said, mentioned earlier, we've got quite a strong balance sheet as funded by the Welsh government. A lot of that cash, we didn't expect to invest in a few years time, but quite rightly, they're challenging us now to say, actually, how can we put that cash to work earlier, focused on decarb initiative? And we've put five, five, five suggestions to them uh, on funds targeting that space. And two have been approved. So, you know, the question is timely. We expect to launch them this year, focused exclusively in that area. In terms of risk, you know, one of the good things I missed out on, on the list about equity is, you know, um, 
we, we're, we're owners of the business. You know, it's a different mindset to having debt in a business to have an equity. We're owners of the business. You know, it, 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 um, it is incumbent upon us to fo follow our cash, even if, even if, even if times, uh, even if the business is not going to plan. It's very different if you've got debt there when you're relying on security to put further investment in because you're compromising your returns position. Um, you know, you may have security. But why would you put more cash in if, it, if it's unsecured? Right, that's the way the banks think, and we think to some extent like that. Equity is a very different mindset. So, you know, we're more likely to support those businesses to come out the other side. So that's good. But actually, we do have a dedicated team in the development bank, our, our risk team, which their focus is primarily on supporting our portfolio. The minute one of our portfolio businesses underperforms, and I don't mean underperforms as in, you know, is about to go through, underperforms is off target, we get those guys in to help. Um, return them to the good book for one of a better description that is their role is how many can we get back into performing in line with expectations they also have a dedicated fund that we can um which has got specific state aid approval that can invest in distressed businesses which is a no-no um in public sector funding uh, but we have a specific approval for that fund to invest in businesses that can be saved you know some businesses can't be saved and you know that you know you, you, you can you can support them, but you couldn't invest again in them. But we do have a team that's dedicated with it and is a very different skill set to the rest of the teams. Um, so we expect them to be busy next couple of years. Thank you very much, Mike. I, I'm going to draw things to a close now because we've overrun. We were late starting and I don't want to overrun um, too significantly. If any of you are online and you have a question that you would have liked to have asked, then please do email it through to me or, or just send it through in the chat box. We'll pick it up now. and We can put it to Mike or to Sean after the event and I'm sure they'll pick it up. Anyone here in the audience, um, I guess you can grab Mike or Sean if you've got any other questions that you wanted to ask. On behalf of the school, can I just say thank you to the two of you? We, we did a session on um, inflation and the cost of living last month, and that was almost totally a, a sort of negative and a slightly depressing session. I sent some positivity today. There were some bits and pieces in there that seemed as though they were positive. So thank you both um, so much for coming in to join us. Uh, thank you all for joining us, whether it was online or here in the uh, business school. We look forward to seeing you again soon and hope you have a great day. Thank you.